Hey everyone, first thing I want to say, massive, massive shout out to everyone who commented on the Manchester Derby analysis video. Uh, really pleased to hear that everyone seemed to like it and that you wanted more. So for that reason, I am now going to give you more. If you've just come across this video and you haven't checked out the Manchester Derby analysis uh, video, there'll be a link to it in the description or you can click on my channel where on your way to my channel you can of course click the subscribe button and the like button on this video <laughs> um, where you'll be able to find that video. City fielded their usual 4-3-3 with the more defensively capable Gundogan replacing the in-form David Silva. Guardiola was clearly aware of the quality that Spurs possess, particularly in central areas with players like Deli Ali, Dembele and Christian Eriksen, and therefore opted to go with the stronger defensive option who's inclined to drop a little bit deeper, a little bit like De Bruyne does and help out a little bit more defensively as opposed to David Silva, even though regardless of this, Gundogan still remains an excellent technical player. Spurs, meanwhile, fielded their usual flexible 4-2-3-1 with Sun almost at times playing like a second striker down the right hand side to kind of support Harry Kane up front. This often ended up looking more like a bit of a narrow 4-4-2 diamond due to most of the width coming from the Spurs wing backs. Spurs played with a very narrow shape in the middle of the park with the intention of trying to flood and prevent the City playmakers from having much space on the ball, relying solely on their wing backs in Trippier and Danny Rose for width. This would also increase the chances of them being able to win the ball back and win back second balls further up the field, utilising Kane's physical presence to complement the high pressure game they were playing. So very much unlike Manchester United and Mourinho's low block pressure style of play in the Manchester derby, Spurs on the other hand were playing a much higher pressure game, aiming to win the ball back in the Man City defensive half, in the Spurs final third going forwards and uh, apply a lot of pressure onto the Man City back four and uh, defensive midfielder in Fernandinho. However, due to how technically capable Manchester City are at playing out the back, that includes Edison, who for a goalkeeper is probably on par in terms of being able to pass the ball with a lot of Premier League midfielders out there, Spurs would often end up over committing with their high block pressure game. And then, obviously, that would leave them defensively exposed. They probably would have been better off with more of a medium block, aiming to apply pressure in the middle of the park after City's fullbacks start to venture forward, which also would leave more exploitation room available behind City's high line for Pochettino's side. Protection for the Spurs wingbacks was also going to be crucial up against Sterling and Sane, but unfortunately, it just wasn't there. So, where was the problem for Spurs? Obviously, this is very different to what, for example, Mourinho Man United tried to do against Man City, where a lot of people were like, well, Mourinho Man United, they should have applied more pressure to City, they should have, you know, pressured them more in their own half and whatnot, instead of just sitting back and defending deep. Well, the main issue for Spurs was that Man City are so damn good at playing the ball out of the back. Fernandinho drops in, centre-backs split, Walker and Delph hug the touchline. So many different passing options for Edison, and that's before you even consider De Bruyne and Gundogan dropping back, right? So not only do the Spurs players end up being outnumbered anyways, which means that the chances of especially a player like Edison, who's so good on the ball, not actually being able to play the ball out and actually finding a City player. The problem is when a City player is found, these have pushed forward. The wide players for Spurs, meaning Sane, Sterling, have exactly what they want, which is pace to run into, or space, sorry, to run into with their pace. But also, if the ball eventually, like, finds Walker, who can find De Bruyne, for example, one, two, three, four Spurs players are already out of the equation from a defensive perspective. Now, obviously, they will try and track back and whatnot, but this is the ideal scenario. One thing this City side are very good at doing, obviously, they're very good at keeping the ball, playing with the ball, keeping the ball and having a lot of possession. But they're even better at counter-attacking and Guardiola has made sure they are good at doing that. And the way that Spurs were playing with this very high block pressing game, as much as I hate to say it, was almost playing into the hands of Man City. So really, due to how technically capable Manchester City are at playing out the back, including Edison, 
Spurs would often overcommit with their high block pressure game, and it would just end up leaving them defensively exposed. 13 minutes in, City already got the opener from a corner. Now, I've seen a popular YouTube football analyst put the blame on man marking, but clearly Spurs opted for more of a mixed marking approach. They weren't man marking from that corner. This can be seen from the positions of Harry Kane and Winks, uh, who were zonally marking on the edge of the six-yard box. However, the truth was that Son should have really tracked the run from deep that Gundogan made to get on the end of the cross. And you can also argue that Kane could have done better utilising his height when trying to head the ball away as it entered his zone. Winks, who was just behind him, zonally marking the space in front of Loris, could have also attacked the ball, but from his perspective, he probably thought Harry Kane was going to leap and head the ball away. Like, if Harry Kane had got just a whisker on that ball, it probably wouldn't have fallen into the path of Gundogan. But altogether, not a goal that was really scored down to City's brilliance, rather Spurs' inability to defend a simple set-piece. But for me, the fact that City have been scoring from set-pieces against these bigger sides regularly really just goes to show that they just honestly... They deserve to win the Premier League, and in games like this, up against other top four, top five sides, where three points are massive, especially in a title race, being able to score from set pieces can often make such a massive difference. And we certainly saw that in the Manchester derby, where the game ended 2-1. But going into the end of the first half, Spurs were quiet, and were constantly vulnerable to City's counter-attack, due to their high block pressure game that we discussed, where a lot of the time, the back four were just exposed. And on top of the pressure that was happening in the opposition half as Man City would create attacks, it would also result in Trippier and Rose joining in, which, in a way, watching the game at times, I kind of felt sorry for Dyer, Dembele and Vertonghen. This is why Mourinho played as deep as he did against City, and in truth, City actually struggled to play against United. City didn't play too well. So to people who were constantly giving Mourinho grief after that game and saying United were far too negative, Spurs were the exact opposite of negative with the way they were playing. And, well, even though Spurs were away from home, if you ask me, I think I know which of the two teams maybe had the better game against City or maybe hindered City's game a little bit more. So as we discussed, uh, due to the high block press that Spurs were playing... As a result of that, most of Man City's attacks actually ended up coming down the Spurs' right-hand side. And it was Kieran Trippier who basically found himself really struggling to balance both his offensive and defensive duties. And this was clear to see on not one, not two, but numerous occasions. Now, Danny Rose wasn't really much better, but utilising the directness and pace of Sane was clearly something that Man City felt like they could benefit from. And overall... Dyer also really struggled, and obviously when you kind of come up against a team who play the way that Man City do, knowing that there's blistering pace in the form of Sané and Sterling, you probably want your fullbacks to basically still remain aware of them. So if you think about when City played Chelsea, Conte's Chelsea early on in the season, it hindered Chelsea offensively because most of Chelsea's width comes from the wing backs because they play a 3-5-2 this season, right? So the width mainly comes from the two wing backs going forwards. And simply down to the offensive threat that both Sane and Sterling possess, it resulted in Chelsea not being able to mount many attacks because both Alonso and Azpilicueta were instructed to try and remain tight to both Sane and Sterling. To try and counter that, Sane and Sterling would end up hugging the touchline to make the pitch as big as possible, but most importantly, to try and hold the wing-backs back, whereas Delft would come into the middle of the park and give Man City the extra man in the middle of the park so they didn't really have the wide areas to worry about and they could focus on playing their own game. In this scenario, though, Pochettino's side actually opted to basically still look to throw their wide players forward, which a lot of the time meant it was counter-attack heaven for Man City, and anyone who watched the game will know that. And with Son as well being so offensively minded, like we said, sometimes he'd almost be on par with Harry Kane and look like a second striker, it really didn't help Kieran Trippier on this right-hand side. City could have easily been 2 or 3-0 up at half-time as a result 
of this, but Sterling's poor finishing, combined with some really great saves from Hugo Lloris, really kept Spurs in the game. It was just far too easy for City though, because of the lack of defensive attributes as well in general, within the Spurs midfield. Especially after going 1-0 down, Spurs seemed set up more to get an equaliser than remain defensively resilient and prevent a second one going in, which really, it, not only a second one could have gone in, but three or four could have gone in at a certain point if it wasn't for Lloris. Um, and it just basically at times seemed like Pochettino was not really willing to adapt and reconsider, especially given how lucky Spurs were to only be 1-0 down at half-time. It was almost like he wanted to fight fire with fire, but it clearly wasn't working for the London side. So due to Pochettino's stubbornness and lack of squad depth as well, to really be able to kind of bring on a ball-winning midfielder style of player to start throwing himself around in the middle of the park and really start to cause De Bruyne and Gundogan problems because for me, Deli Ali was dreadful throughout the entire game and was not willing to really uh, give much defensively and should have probably been sent off twice, which would have left Spurs in an even worse scenario. Harry Winks is a player I'm not entirely convinced about and I still feel like he's more of a creative player. And Moussa Dembele is a decent all-round player, but still, for me, isn't really that defensively solid player who'll throw himself around a bit and make defensive saving tackles. Maybe like Dyer would if he was in the middle of the park and Alderweireld wasn't injured, for example. Spurs struggled to match City, trying to utilise mainly the central areas. And the reason why they were trying to mainly utilise the central areas was basically to try and put as much pressure as possible to reduce the amount of space in the middle of the park that players like Gundogan and De Bruyne had. But also simultaneously, it's also where most of Spurs' strength is with players like Deli Ali, Dembele, Eriksen and Son Heung Min who drop into that area as well. But simultaneously, due to the lack of width, because Trippier and Rose were always kind of trying to be wary of Sani and Sterling at the same time and then they struggled to get forward and Spurs didn't really have much width and when they did they'd lose the ball and Sani and Sterling would have a field day. Harry Kane was often forced to end up dropping deep himself and try and help out the midfield which resorted in him having to resort to long shots from outside the box when realistically he'd probably rather be in the box getting in on the end of crosses. And even though we saw at times players like Son and Eriksen try and drift out wide and some link-up play to really happen between the fullback and kind of your Eriksen and Son, it was a real struggle for Eriksen up against Walker. Otamendi's very physical as well. And massive, massive shout-out to both Gundogan and De Bruyne. Now, I already discussed that Gundogan is defensively a lot more resolute than someone like Silva was. And both De Bruyne and Gundogan, if you go back and watch the game, did so much legwork. Because when you think of these players, you think mainly of playmakers that, you know want to go forward, want to score goals, want to play awesome defence splitting passes. But the amount of legwork these two did was phenomenal, especially De Bruyne towards the end of the second half. In fact, I think it was the third goal where Spurs had a throw in and De Bruyne won the ball back off Dembele and created the goal almost all by himself. Played the ball, I think it was to Sane, who then put it across the box for Sterling. And when you've got such a complete midfielder like that, there's only so much you can do. But from a Spurs perspective, it also makes you wonder where on earth is a weakness within this particular player. So like I said, if you go back and watch the match, just pay attention to how starved of service Kane was and how difficult it was for Spurs to really get crosses into the box to utilise Kane in his strength, which is being in the box, getting on the end of crosses. Just see how often he'd try and drop deep to the midfield and shoot from distance. And even though he came close, at the end of the day, up against a keeper like Edison and up against a defence like Man City's, it was always going to be tough. In the second half, Spurs midfield was still lacklustre defensively. Son should have really helped trip you out more for the opportunity when Sané cut inside and Sterling missed the open net rebound, which really should have been 2-0 at that point. City was still taking advantage of the space narrow Spurs were leaving out wide, where Trippier and Rose were trying to get forward, trying to help out, but it just seemed like every time they did, Sané and Sterling would abuse that space, um, and Spurs were just not really willing to change their approach, give Trippier and Rose a little bit more protection, um, and maybe try and play a little bit wider to try and match Man City, because clearly trying to focus on narrow play and a high-pressure game was useless when Spurs just couldn't win the ball back. 
Proof of this is how De Bruyne's goal came from the exact same scenario as we were seeing in the first half. Trippier got caught out on the right-hand side, leaving Eric Dyer with far too much to do. Just go back and watch the goal. Was City's counter-attack so good that City had De Bruyne, Sani and Sterling all in the Spurs box? Or was Spurs' defence so poor that they found themselves in a 2 versus 3 situation in their own box? Go back, watch it, and you tell me. But it was just really worrying how, from the first half, it was the same pattern again and again and again. And Spurs really, even though at times it looked like they were trying to change their, their, their shape, they still remained with the narrow approach until perhaps when Lamella came on and gave him a little bit more width. But by the point Lamella came on, you could argue the damage was already done and the damage should have already been done in the first half. City goal number three all begins with a Spurs throw in their own half where they have four players already in the opposition half. So the scenario was kind of a little bit like this. So I'm not entirely sure if it was Rose or Davis at this point, but basically, I mean, it could have been someone else. But the point is, the third goal essentially stemmed from throwing in towards Dembele, De Bruyne, uh, closed down Dembele and won the ball back. And then as Rose tried to get back and Trippier found himself in a scenario trying to get back with Sane and Sterling pushing forward. Um, the problem was, even though this isn't 100% accurate, we can go back and watch the goal and see what I mean. The problem was, because the throwing was taken from near the halfway line and Spurs at this point were obviously 2-0 down, if they can get one goal back in this point from their mindset, they're probably thinking something along the lines of, right, make it 2-1, we've still got about 20 minutes to go, we can still get a draw out of this. And you end up with one, two, three, four players in the opposition half. So as soon as that ball was lost and Sane and Sterling were ready to pounce and De Bruyne actually ended up taking the ball not just past Dembele but past another player as well for the sake of it we'll assume it was Winks as soon as De Bruyne took them two players out of the equation you're in a four versus four situation and up against the pace of Sane the pace of Sterling the pace of I think it was Gabriel at the time so after he missed his penalty so Spurs could have been 3-0 down at this point I think um yeah, you know, there's only so much you can really do from this point here. And that's what I mean when I say De Bruyne, really, was just phenomenal in terms of being a complete player. Not only was he phenomenal in terms of his passing and technical play, but he was working hard, helping out defensively, which is maybe something someone like Adele Ali wasn't doing. And if he really is to raise his game, or a Son, or an Eriksson, you know, you talk about these players, and you say that a few years ago, Spurs came really close to winning the title. Well, I think this City team are really showing us why... Maybe they didn't win the title or why they were overachieving at that point. Because in terms of these players, very good creative players, decent on the ball, good dribblers, but not really complete players. Whilst you look at some of the players that Man City have and it just feels like especially players like De Bruyne and Gundogan or maybe David Silva, Pep Guardiola has managed to get elements out of their games that we may be did not imagine previously. I mean, the fact that he plays Fabian Delph at left back and what he's been able to get out of Fabian Delph at left back for me really says a lot. Sterling, until Guardiola's management, for me was average. You know, playing for England, average. Playing for Liverpool, average. No one really understood the price tag. But with Sterling currently being top goal scorer in the Premier League, he has a way somehow of just developing or getting the best out of players or getting that extra kind of drop of talent out of players that you probably never even imagined they had. And I really don't want to sound biased here, and I'm not a Man City fan, but it just genuinely is what is setting them apart from the rest. And they just look like a much, much more complete team. And it looks like they've got players, they've got goalkeepers who are capable of passing the ball like midfielders. They've got centre-backs who step into midfield and retain possession. Um, they've got players like De Bruyne who just do it all in terms of midfielders. You know, you've got players who are great defensive midfielders, but going forward, not that much. De Bruyne can do it all. But the point is, though, from that throw, obviously Spurs were expecting to go forward. Trippier was also, you can argue, also somewhat caught out of position because he was hugging kind of the halfway line there. And then as soon as De Bruyne won the ball back, it was just basically a four versus four situation or five versus five situation, I think it was. De Bruyne did really well to take two out of the equation. He left Dembele behind him, took the ball past another. Gundogan was then found as he made a run forward and then he thread the ball nice and easy towards Sane, who eventually ended up playing it across the box to Sterling, who finally uh, got his goal. And 
can you really blame Trippier for this? Maybe not, but it just goes to show that if you're going to be a team who is basically challenging for the Premier League, you can't afford to make mistakes like Spurs did. You can argue the first goal was a mistake from a set piece, and this third goal was also a mistake from a set piece. So Rose maybe as well could have done better to track Sterling's run, but again, easier said than done. Was this a goal because of City's greatness? Or a result of Spurs giving the ball away cheaply. I mean, you can argue, I would argue this goal was created by the greatness of a single man in the form of Kevin De Bruyne. He's probably the most complete midfielder in the Premier League right now. Chelsea fans should be kicking themselves for letting this guy go. Um, he's an absolute workhorse. Great defensively. Fantastic going forward. He not only won the ball back, but proceeded to take it past another player, which really created the goal. Allowed him to find Gundogan, who then played the killer pass. So yes, Spurs were poor. Yes, I can see why they were pouring men forward in that kind of scenario. But ultimately, the mistake cost them. Even though you can argue the game was probably already lost at 2-0 and should have been lost earlier on. 85th minute, same old story. Spurs were starting to look a little bit better given that Lamella came on to give them a little bit more width. But in reality, the game was over. Trippier, nowhere to be found. Bernardo Silva, really one-on-one -on -one with Lloris, should have scored and didn't City could have been 5 or 6 nil up by that point, not forgetting Gabriel Jesus's missed penalty. Trippier was dragged central due to Spurs' midfielders again not tracking back. We didn't see much tracking back from Son, which is part of the reason why Trippier was just so exposed. We saw little to no tracking back from Deli Alley, and up against a team like Man City, when their midfield are working as hard as they are, Spurs did not deserve to get anything out of the, out of the game. It's really that simple. Um, but yeah, uh, Silva should have really scored. Four minutes later, 89th minute. The less said about this one, the better. Lloris won't be proud of it. If you've seen it, you'll know what I'm talking about. But Sterling will certainly be proud of the fact that he's currently the top goal scorer in the Premier League and really should have scored more this game. And it was just very, very disappointing. You know, going into the game, you're expecting... People looking at Man, at Man United or Mourinho's Man United saying, oh, they're not that good of a team and whatnot. But you think about Spurs and the aura that comes with Pochettino and the way they play football and whatnot, and you're expecting a real good tactical battle, two teams that play high-pressure attacking football, locking head-to-head. -head. But from a tactical perspective, Pep didn't really have to change much because Pochettino was just allowing City to knock and knock and knock on the door and just wasn't trying to fill in the gaps where clearly the defence was leaking. And you can argue that's down to Spurs' squad depth as well in midfield. The fact they don't really have complete midfielders who'll give that much defensively in terms of the players that play behind Harry Kane. But I personally still think that there were players on the bench that maybe could have changed the game. And I also think if Dyer was in midfield and Alderweireld was also at defence, then maybe Spurs could have been a little bit more defensively organised. And of course, fair play to Eriksen for a great strike to score a consolation where we probably saw some complacency kick in, particularly from Mangala. Um, now, this has been a Pretty long video, there's not been as much drawing as I kind of maybe wanted to do, but it's always tough to kind of talk and draw at the same time. Now, these don't really make much sense if you've not really watched the game. So, if you haven't watched the game, at least go and watch highlights. Just search for them on YouTube uh, prior to really watching this again and whatnot. And let me know if you think I've missed anything. Uh, obviously, there probably will be stuff that I've missed. Let me know in the comments below. Let me know what you thought. I mean, in conclusion, at 1-0 down, I felt like Pochettino could have adapted his side to be more defensively resilient. At 1-0 down, when you consider the physical ability that Kane gives you up front, when you consider the creativity players like Eriksen and Ali give you, Spurs were always going to have a chance of creating attacks when winning the ball back. The problem for them was that they were just leaving themselves so defensively exposed, almost throwing too many men forward to the point where it actually hindered them in terms of attacking because they could never see the ball and they just found themselves, well, you want to say found themselves defending most of the time, but unfortunately most of the time, half their team was in the opposition half or just nowhere near their own box to actually defend in the first place. And it just... It just wasn't changing, which was really, really disappointing to see. We kept seeing the same patterns again and again and again from City. The same warning bells rang. And to cut a long story short, Spurs just did nothing about it. You mix that in with defensive errors. Dyer obviously made an error for one of the goals. Two set pieces that really could have been avoided. And... Despite the fact that City really should have scored more, let's give them benefit of the doubt and say that it's 1-0... 
Spurs probably could have been able to nick one or two. I mean, Ericsson did score in the end if they maybe had tried to aim to be a little bit more defensively resilient, frustrate Man City a lot more, tire them out when they had the ball, and then try and hit them on the break and utilise the high line that they were playing. But easier said than done, and uh, I think it's safe to say once again that uh, Man City are probably already ce celebrate that Man City are probably already celebrating the Premier League. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Uh, let me know what you thought about the video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you check out the Manchester Derby one as well. It's a little bit different to what's out there, and I don't want to use Premier League footage as well for copyright and whatnot. Um, but yeah, hopefully you enjoyed the video. As always, thanks for watching.